China presents the biggest opportunities for investment and growth in the global economy, but also the biggest threats. While the government speaks confidently of a transition to a more sustainable growth model and a gentle dip in economic performance, concerns are growing about its capacity and willingness to deliver the necessary reforms. This month, we're focusing on China's role in the global outlook, and I'm joined once again by Mike Jakeman from our global forecasting team. Mike, let's start with some numbers. Uh, we're forecasting a, a, a slowdown in China's economy. By how much and why? One of the tricky things we have to do when forecasting China is that we have to look further ahead than the government is willing to show us. So at the moment, the government is saying that it's got a, a target of growth of 6.5% a year for this year, uh, and most likely something very similar for next. We've got to go a bit beyond that. So this year, we think, is, is on track for 6.6, so target met with ease, um, but we think there's trouble ahead. Uh, we think growth is going to slow to 4.2% by 2021, which is the end of our new forecast period. Uh, and within that, there's going to be a big jump down from 6% in 2017 to 4.2% in 2018. Well, wow, OK, uh, that is a big drop. Uh, you know, my understanding is that the Chinese government is a lot more sanguine than that. They, they, they're not talking about sudden, sudden dips in growth. Why are they so confident? What is the probability that actually they may be right and we may be wrong? Well, at the moment, the, the key issue is debt, uh, and the indebtedness of the Chinese economy is rising at a stonking rate, and that's partly because uh, growth is being delivered through uh, more and more credit issuance rather than sort of autonomous growth. So what's, what we think is going to happen is that at some point in this next five years, and we've, we've pinpointed 2018 as the year most likely this is going to happen, uh, the Chinese government is going to have to sacrifice uh, the rates of growth they would like to have uh, in favour of tightening monetary policy and starting to slow the, this rate of debt accumulation. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be completely unsustainable by the end of the forecast period. Right. Um, you've mentioned debt, and of course, you know, China's performed extraordinarily over the last few years. Thank goodness, because at a time when the global economy needed it, mm -hmm. China was providing the demand basically that kept everything afloat. Uh, but as we look across the Chinese economy at the moment, what we, what we see is that an awful lot of debt has been uh, issued against projects that look highly unlikely to deliver the kind of return on investment uh, that would allow those debts to be met. Uh, whenever debt builds up like this, there's always a reckoning. Uh, generally, it's a, quite a sudden one. Um, how do we see that playing out? What do we what do we see China's policy in trying to in trying to deal with that with that crunch when it comes? When do you think it will come? So we've picked twenty eighteen. Uh, at the moment, we we look at a, a measure comparing the levels of credit and the levels of debt, and we think that indebtedness is now over two hundred percent of GDP, which is a point at which in other economies in other uh, previous times in history, such as Japan in the 1990s, is the time at which you know, we really are quite worried. Uh, and as you say, there is, there is usually a reckoning. So in China, we think 2018 is going to be the year when growth lurches down, and that's going to be government-driven. So the government is going to look at uh, monetary policy in that year and go, OK, we cannot continue to have credit growth growing at 3 or 4% the rate of GDP growth, and they're going to whack up interest rates. That is going to feed through into private consumption growth, slowing it, and particularly into investment, which is the area where most of this credit growth is being directed. So we think credit growth is going to slow to about 1% uh, in 2018. And there is a big risk uh, that this, this, it could be a lot worse than this. This is, in a sense, the, the government-managed scenario. Um, and if it all comes off, then they end up with a, a lurch down in growth in that year. But they also have a, a, a big debt fueled disaster uh, in the banking sector. So although this talks about, a, a, this scenario suggests a big fall off in uh, the rate of Chinese growth, it's actually a relatively benign one for the global economy. We think that that would cause big effects uh, in the global economy if, if China suddenly steps down at this rate. It hasn't done it at that, that rate before. Uh, we've seen a really sort of quite well-managed gradual slowdown in Chinese growth. Um, a, a decline of almost two percentage points in a year is, is quite a lot. Um, so that will cause problems elsewhere, but nonetheless, this is not a kind of uh, global economic catastrophe driven by China, which, which perhaps is the alternative if the government doesn't get, manage to get a good grip on this. OK, well, I, I wanted to touch on, on, on that a little, because I want to try and embrace a little here the, the, the risks that, that exist around the Chinese outlook. 
Um, just because it's you know such a, a, a huge driver of, of everything else for us, you know, from commodities prices to global trade to the, the general trajectory of the of the global economy, um, and of course we're dealing with. I mean, you've already said that one of the assumptions we're making here, even within our scenario of quite a, a, a hefty dip in 2018, which uh, doesn't match at the moment the forecast expectation of the of the Chinese mm -hmm. authorities. We're already saying that this relies on the Chinese authorities themselves making policy decisions. Um, and of course, there's a sacrifice uh, involved in that. The, the, the uh, Communist Party would have to accept the cost yep. uh, that comes with those policy decisions. I want to have a, a little think about the possibility that they may choose not to accept those costs or that they may simply misplay the hand in trying to bring that adjustment um, in in as smooth as smooth as possible a manner, you know. There's no point in being alarmist, but let's think about how uh, sure. what happens if uh, that adjustment that we're seeing is necessary in in the provision of credit isn't made or is made in a in a ineffective manner. We have China as the biggest risk on our on our global risk register at the moment. Yep. Talk a little bit about why that is the scope of the risk when we look out into the, you know, over the next five years or so for China? So for a long time, we've been saying that uh, a Chinese hard landing is uh, the biggest risk to our global forecast. And, but, and we, we tried different ways of defining what a hard landing was, and we settled on the idea that it would be a, a two percentage point decline in the rate of growth in any year. And essentially, we're now forecasting that for 2018. So we've got to change the, the language of that risk slightly. Um, and I think that there's a, a very good chance not our central forecast, but a very substantial risk that this drop-off in 2018 ends up being badly managed. How uh, much of a chance? 35 40%. That's quite um, high. That is, yeah. That's mm. pretty much as high as it goes before we have to make it our central forecast. Yeah. So there's a, there is a very good chance that the government's management of, that, of, of this lurch down uh, in growth and this increase in monetary policy is badly managed. Uh, and that would lead to potentially even a recession in China. And as you said, because China is the central cog now in the global economy, it's the most integrated into supply chains, it's the biggest trading partner for the most countries, this would obviously have very large implications for the global economy. Um, the reason we picked 2018, I want to go back to that for a second, is, is partly political, because as you said, this is everything in China depends on the manoeuvrings of the Communist Party. Uh, in 2017, there is a, a restructuring of the seven-member Politburo, uh, and we expect that Xi Jinping, the president, will manage to secure uh, promotions for his allies, which will keep his position secure, and that will be that that enables him to then drive this uh, tightening of monetary policy uh, and this, to the government's economic strategy in 2018. Um, huge risks if they get it wrong, um, and indeed the, there will be a lot of volatility even if they get it right, because the global economy hasn't experienced this kind of slowdown from China before. An alternative scenario, they get it wrong. Perhaps if they get it really, really wrong uh, and we have a global recession as a result, it might cause a more thorough shakeout of Chinese state-owned uh, companies that are in effect zombie firms uh, and are very unproductive and are a big drain on investment. Perhaps in that scenario, you could end up with a China that's actually slightly healthier by the end of our forecast period. But the short-term damage to the global economy would be, would be worse. So in a sense, you've got two fairly unappetizing scenarios regarding China. There is always a reckoning. That's going to be the phrase we'll use, I think. Um, the first one is uh, a lurch down in growth of the global economy survives, but perhaps Chinese growth after that is more lackluster than it could be. Or you get a, a big bang uh, that perhaps causes some real casualties in the banking sector. Uh, but after that, you get a, a, a Chinese uh, rate of growth that's perhaps a little bit higher after that. So, in a way, it's pick your poison, I think. Okay. Uh, finally, I want to dis uh, give you the opportunity to dismiss one risk, which I'm sure a lot of people will have on their mind, because we've talked about uh, you know a range of, of scenarios uh, where things go benignly or less benignly for China. Mm -hmm. What we haven't mentioned is the possibility that... Uh, the sustainability of China's political system is brought into question. And therefore, you know, the integrity of, uh, almost the integrity of China uh, as a nation in, in the way that we conceive of it today. I think that that floats around out there always for people. Do you want to comment on that as, as an element of the risk uh, that we might consider? I think it's fair to say that the Chinese government is trying to uh, 
uh, make China a very large version of Singapore, where voters uh, perhaps forego a little bit of political independence in exchange for enormous wealth creation. And so far, uh, this, this transition that the government is making, uh, I think it's gone quite, you know, quite well. I mean, you know, there is limited amounts of social unrest that the government quashes very quickly. Um, but provided the economy keeps growing, then that trade-off is, you know, seems to be made quite well. Um, obviously, the, the risk of that rises if the economy hits the rocks, and the government is very, very aware of that, which is why uh, you know, monetary policy and, and economic policy even more broadly is, is rooted in politics. Um, so, yes, the risk of uh, social unrest rises along with uh, the deterioration of the economy. Um, I'm not sure that in either of those scenarios we're expecting uh, a revolution or the end of the CCP, um, but don't think that those considerations aren't being uh, considered when any of these moves are, are calculated. Good, thank you. I, I just wanted to, you know, make sure that that elephant was visible in the room rather than sort of sitting off in a corner somewhere. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, it sounds like we have a bit of a sort of crunch time coming up in 2018 for China, which of course we'll we'll be keeping our eyes yeah. on. We'll be back next month to discuss other issues uh, around the global outlook. So do please join us then. Thank you.